Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carolina Breast Friends YouTube channel. I'm really excited about our session tonight. We have guest speakers from Hologic, Ryan Dunleavy, and Dr. Chris Schindel, and Scheidel, excuse me. And they will be speaking on the Breast Cancer Index, which is a gene express based test that examines an individual's unique tumor biology to help physicians make a more informed decision regarding the extension of endocrine therapy. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Wonderful. Go ahead and get started for us, Chris. Perfect. Let me share my screen. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Good. Yep. I'll let uh, Ryan do the intro. Sure. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you so much for having us. We really uh, appreciate it. Um, tonight, we're just going to tell you a little bit about breast cancer index, um, which is and we say the new standard in extended endocrine therapy decision making. Um, I'm Ryan Dunleavy. I'm I'm with the key accounts team for Hologic, so uh, I cover uh, most of the East Coast for the bigger institutions. Um, and along with me is Dr. Chris Scheidel. Um, he's our medical science liaison uh, for that same region. So we both cover kind of up and down the East Coast, but we're also um, both Charlatans. So uh, so we're very grateful to be here. Um, locally. So I'll let Chris kind of kick it off and we'll go from there. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so I initially just wanted to start off with a little background on um, early stage hormone receptor uh, positive breast cancer, which is what our breast cancer index test is indicated for. Uh, one of the hallmarks of this disease um, is the fact that most recurrences happen after year five post-diagnosis. Uh, and I know that this is a busy infographic, um, but that fact that most of those recurrences do happen during those later years set off a series of trials uh, where physicians looked at, if we extend beyond five years, can we prevent some of those recurrences? Uh, and really the take home from this infographic is irrespective of treatment sequence, uh, be it tamoxifen or AI or the combination uh, in the primary and the extended setting, they generally saw a, a relatively uh, modest um, disease-free survival benefit that usually hovered around three to 5%. Uh, and what this would indicate is that for the majority of women, uh, extending beyond five years uh, is really not gonna do much in terms of preventing those recurrences. Um, as you know, with treatment, there's always that balance between benefit and adverse events. I really don't need to go over this, this slide with you all because I'm sure you have um, you know, more knowledge about these than I do, but for a 5% benefit, <clears throat> we ask, um, you know, is it worth that 50% of women that have quality of life and tolerability challenges? Uh, those range from anywhere from bone and joint pain, hot flashes, sexual dysfunction, um, to even grade three and grade four adverse events. So with your AIs, you're talking about uh, bone toxicities, um, new osteoporosis, fractures, so on and so forth. And even with tamoxifen, um, some of your secondary cancers, uh, pulmonary embolisms and heart disease can be pretty serious side effects. Um, so really this begs the question, is there a way that we can classify patients to spare those that don't necessarily need to stay on for an additional five years uh, while also identifying those that do? So traditionally, uh, physicians have used uh, prognosticated risk um, to kind of make that decision. Uh, a lot of your clinical and pathologic features, such as tumor grade, tumor size, nodal involvement, um, KI-67, even some other genomic assays, such as Oncotype, right, uh, have been used to make that decision uh, based on prognosticated risk. Um, and what we're challenging here is that even though um, some of those are actually prognostic, uh, they don't really predict benefit of who needs to be extended and who's going to get that uh, benefit from extending beyond five years. Uh, and that's really where the clinical utility of the breast cancer index test falls in, uh, because we are the only predictive test for determining that benefit uh, for EET or extended endocrine therapy. Um, so what is the BCI? Uh, really, it's two components in one. Um, I'll start over on the right uh, with the BCI prognostic, 
Uh, and this gives you an individual risk of late distant recurrence. So what we provide is what is the percentage of having a recurrence within the late years, which are years five through 10. Um, so the components of this test are actually molecular grade index, and then what we call the H over I uh, index. Um, and H over I is what we use on the other side uh, for the BCI predictive. Um, now what H over I interrogates is how likely are they to benefit from extending? And what it answers is if we block estrogen receptor signaling, how likely is this patient's tumor likely to, is it likely to respond? Um, so uh, Dr. VK Gotti is, is the director of medical oncology at the University of Illinois. He does a really good job of kind of discriminating uh, predictive versus prognostic tests. And really just the, the slide really highlights um, uh, his overview of that. So while many tests are prognostic, very few are actually predictive. Uh, prognostic will answer, how is this patient, how is this patient um, in terms of outcome? Are they likely to recur? Are they not likely to recur? Whereas <clears throat> the predictive says, if we intervene with this specific intervention, how does that change the outcome of that patient? Um, so really it's two very independent um, tests. Um, the BCI report is relatively simple and we want this to be shared between the physician and the patient. Um, it's two simple boxes. On the top, we have the predictive component. Um, it's a binary decision. It's either yes or no. No, they will not benefit from extending. Yes, they will benefit from extending. Um, below that, we actually provide the individual risk of late distant recurrence as a percent. So in this, um, in this example, we see in the, in the uh, predictive box, no. So they're unlikely to benefit from extending beyond five years. The prognostic result says they have a 2.2% chance of recurrence in years five to 10. Um, now, take these together. That 2.2% is not going to change uh, regardless of whether or not this patient is extended or not. Even if they get another five years of endocrine therapy, that 2.2% remains 2.2%. Now, conversely, if this predictive result was a yes, um, that suggests that that percent can be reduced by about thirds uh, by extending beyond year five. Um, so that goes from 2.2 to about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, and I do have a couple of test reports. If we have time, we can go over those, um, but I'd be happy to pass those out after the presentation. So I'm gonna let Ryan go over um, some of our validation studies and a little more data related to that. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it, Chris. So um, like you said, we're, we're trying to make that, um, that test report to be a really shared tool between the patient and the provider. Um, and, and where all of that comes from, and he said, you know, if you do get a BCI, yes, then that risk of recurrence can go down by about two thirds. This is where we get that number. So you can see the row across the middle in the numbers in red, um, when, when it is a BCI yes and the patient will benefit from staying on, we, see, we saw about a 65% reduction in the relative risk. So it takes that down by, by the two thirds. You'll also see <clears throat> on the bottom, if there's a BCI no, there is no significant benefit. And that's where we get the idea of this, your particular tumor was not powered by estrogen. So going on an anti-estrogen medicine is, is not gonna help past five years. Um, and then across the top row, you can see that it, it across all of the different trials, it doesn't matter if it's tamoxifen, if it's AI, if it's a combination of the two, no matter what endocrine therapy you might be on, um, we saw that the numbers were relatively the same across the board. Um, our, our, really our last study, um, was was the final the final piece of data that we really needed to have our test included in the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. So these are really the two very big panels um, made up of of key opinion leaders around the country, um, and they update their guidelines on on sort of standard of care when it comes to oncology. Um, January of 2021, they included breast cancer index. Um, into their guidelines as the only predictive test when it comes to extended endocrine therapy. Uh, um, and then the ASCO guidelines just did the same this past April. So now both, both of the really big panels, um, you know, in, endorse us as the only predictive test 
like Dr. Uh, Shadow talked about before. So this slide right here um, is sort of the big, why does BCI exist? Okay, so um, this was part of a uh, of our clinical utility trial that we did with, with Yale and UPMC. So on the left-hand side, we're talking about avoiding over-treatment. Um, in patients assumed to have a clinically high-risk disease, so there's nodal in involvement, um, and most clinicians would say, okay, this is definitely a 10-year patient. We're going to extend you. Um, when we tested those patients with BCI, uh, BCI identified 22% as having limited risk of late distance recurrence, and 69% of those were not likely to benefit from extended endocrine therapy. Now, on the flip side, on the right-hand side, this would be clinically low risk. So T1N0, this might be where the doctor said, hey, this was a small tumor. We caught it early. Um, all signs point to being a five-year patient, and, and we're good with you coming off at five years. When BCI was kind of laid on top of that, it, we BCI identified 25% as likely to benefit from extended endocrine therapy, and those patients were at a potentially higher risk of late distance recurrence. So that would be an undertreatment where they came off at five years, and hey, those patients really should have stayed out for 10. Um, this is really the whole game changer behind BCI. If, if they go by the old traditional clinical and pathologic features, um, you may be overtreated, you may be undertreated. Uh, BCI is the only test that can help really determine which is which. Um, so this is kind of that, that same study. We gave a whole bunch of charts to all of these providers and said, okay, which patients would be five-year and which would be 10. Then we gave them the BCI results. And in 30% of the cases, they changed their mind. So where they may have been a five-year, they changed their mind to 10. And where it may be a 10, they changed their mind to a five. So this is really the utility um, impact when it comes to what BCI can do for, for you and your provider. And Chris, I'll, I'll pass it back to you to talk a little bit more about maybe where it should be ordered and, and how it can be used. Perfect. Um, so I alluded to this at the very beginning. Um, BCI is indicated uh, for several patient populations. Um, first of all, you need to be ER or PR positive, so hormone receptor positive. Um, early stage, so N0 up to N1, which is up to three positive nodes. Um, and then again, at that five-year time point, when your physician is starting to have that discussion, um, you need to be disease-free. And generally, we say BCI needs to be ordered around year four. So again, whenever that conversation with your, with your physician starts to happen, um, that's when they would traditionally order BCI so that when you go in for your five checkup, they say, we're going to order this test. We're going to use it to help make uh, an, a more informed decision at year five as to whether or not uh, you need that additional five years. Again, uh, just to kind of highlight, we do provide uh, two uh, big components or two big pieces of information. One is the predictive, which is the likelihood of benefit from therapy. Uh, that's that simple yes or no. And then again, we provide that individual risk uh, of distant recurrence, which is uh, years five through 10. Uh, so this is just a, a very uh, short infographic of what indications we do have and what patient populations. So we have validation and pre and postmenopausal. Um, again, lymph node positive, up to three positive nodes, lymph node negative, um, T1 through T3 tumor size, um, any tumor grade. HER2 positive and HER2 negative, again, must be hormone receptor positive, so it can be ER and or PR. Uh, we also test on uh, chemo chemotherapy treated, untreated. Again, our results are predicated on the fact that when you do order that test, you are disease free. Um, and then we also are indicated for both ductal and lobular histologies. And I'll pass it back to Ryan to talk about billing. Yeah, so we, we decided to include this just because, you know, a, a common question is like, well, oh, this is great. So what, what does it mean? How do I, um, how do I go ahead and, and get it paid for? So the order goes off to our lab in San Diego. And when that happens, our patient assistance program will actually contact the patient if it's a commercial, uh, if it's a commercially insured patient. So your insurance information comes over with the test order. Um, and then we became a provider side by side with your doctor. Okay, so um, this this isn't run through the institution. It's not 
you know, it's not off separate. So we become a provider um, alongside the doctor. So Medicare, it's 100% of patients are covered. Um, if it's commercial, after that order um, is received, our service team will contact the patient and talk with you about um, your particular um, insurance plan, if it's covered, if it's not covered, et cetera. The patient always has the, the right to first refusal, so we'll never just run it and then hit hit you with a bill. We know that's happened with some other companies. Um, we made a commitment to not be one of those. So um, our patient assistance program is going to reach out to you and talk through all of the options and all of the, the payments. Um, the ordering you don't need to worry about, that's for the office. Um, in terms of the results, once we get the, um, the sample, it takes anywhere from seven to 10 days to, to run the test and then get the results back to your office. So, um, so yeah, in terms of a very direct question, in terms of uh, insurances, we are in network with over 50% of insurances and that's that number is going up and up, especially now that we're in the NCCN and the ASCO panels. Um, once those panels really say, hey, this is sort of standard of care, insurance companies sort of follow suit. So we're in that process all right now. So it's over 50% of insurances cover it currently, but that number is going up all the time. This slide here is just um, is really just the, the legal coverage of, of what we talked about tonight. Um, so you can uh, read your way through all of that if, you, if you'd like. Um, and then we'll just wrap it up with this. So, so breast cancer index um, is really already being woven into clinical practice, especially at, um, at Novant um, and, and at LCI specifically. Um, so we're working with them to, to make things easy for them and, and easy for, for you all on the patient side. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, this is pretty much the short of it. So I, I know there was a question, um, in the chat and, and I'll get to that here in, in just a second, but, um, yeah, again, th thank you for having us. We really appreciate it.